What's going on team? It's Jacob Gollin. Welcome to another episode of the Master Your Craft Study. Glad to have you guys with us. First of all, shout out to Sean Sweeney. Uh, Sean's a great friend of mine and he is now part of the MYC team. We will make a blog post and probably bring him on the show. He's a former college coach, now a high school basketball coach in Macon, Georgia. And he's doing a tremendous job. He's a guy that's committed to excellence and I'm super excited to have Sean be part of the team. He actually just published his first uh, article on the Master Your Craft Study website the blog. It's about multi-sport athletes and some of the benefits to being a multi-sport athlete, especially earlier in your career. So go ahead and check that out. That's over at dmycstudy.com. If you are somebody or if you know somebody who loves to write or who loves to read about athletic excellence or stories about athletes, coaches, and trainers and their athletic prowess is something that excites you, please contact us. Go ahead, send an email to contact at myc.team and reach out. We're looking for a few more members to write on behalf of the program. So if you're one of those people that might be interested in letting your voice be heard, we might have the platform for you. So shoot us an email and we'll see if we can work something out. This week's fan shout out goes to Max Trebitowski. On Twitter, Max says, great work. I enjoy listening to the podcast. You're an inspiring guy, Jake. Keep them coming. Max, I greatly appreciate it, my friend. You keep doing you. I believe Max is in a higher educational administrative role where he's impacting the lives of young men and women. So Max, you go ahead and keep doing your thing as well. Keep being the guiding light for those people in the, in the higher ed system. I know that you're a hard worker and that you're going to continue to improve in what you're doing as well. Master your craft, buddy. Thanks for the shout out. Today's guest can be defined in a lot of different ways, but one that keeps coming to my mind is the adversity that he's faced. He's a former NFL player, uh, but long before that, he faced a lot of different struggles and issues in his life that most of us never have to face, or, or if we do, maybe one or two things, and it seems like at every single turn, he's faced with some sort of adversity or obstacle, and his ability to overcome and the mindset that he maintains throughout is pretty incredible. His name is Anthony Trucks, and he owns a gym now out in California. He gets paid the big bucks to be a keynote speaker on the corporate level and also has authored books and some other programs online. So he's been very successful in every single thing that he's done and his stories and his wisdom in this show are absolutely invaluable. We talk a lot about coaching. We talk a lot about psychology. We talk a lot about adversity, all those different things. So I'm excited that you guys are able to hear from him because I know in just my interviewing of him that I've learned a lot and there's a lot of perspective that I gained through our conversation. So without further delay, here's my conversation with Anthony Trucks. Anthony, welcome to the Master Your Craft Study, man. Thanks for coming on. Oh, man. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to chatting. Well, tell the folks a little bit about what you got going on right now. Uh, Man, right now, you know, it's funny. I think we all have these moments in time where we're shifting, like you were just talking about shifting and transitioning. And um, for me, I'm actually in the middle of a really big shift. I had a mastermind last week where I hung out with um, like Lewis House, Trent Shelton, Brennan Burchard, Dean Graziosi, Jeff Walker, like these amazing minds. And they challenged me to actually shift my entire brand of Trust Your Hustle to something different. Because um, I'm a hustler. Like I'm a sports guy. A lot of us athletes get that. You, you drive, you grind, you, you grow. Um, but they're like, you know, and which you'll probably hear about throughout my life. Like I grew up through a lot of craziness. I was, you know, foster care, adopted by an all-white family, um, sports in and out of that, my marriage, having a kid, a teenager, like a lot of different identity chains and shifts. And so what I'm working on now, literally in the middle of it, is, uh, is kind of come up with a name for my, my program and my whole new coaching direction, which will be based on teaching people how to address the shifts of identity and, and life as they go through it. So something happens, who am I now? You know, we leave sports, who am I without sports? Who am I without my kids who went to school? Who am I without this career I thought made my, my name and I got fired, right? How do we navigate those things either reactively or proactively better? Yeah, that's awesome. Well, in researching a little bit about you, Anthony, it came to my mind that you were probably one of the most experienced individuals that I know in the field of adversity. It just mm-hmm. kind of seemed like every couple of years or, or even less than that, you were having to face some sort of adversity that most people would only have to face maybe once or twice in a lifetime. And you've gone through a ton of them. Uh, we're not going to touch on all those things. And I know that a lot of these are probably things that are near and dear to your heart, both positively mm-hmm. and negatively. But Uh, Talk a little bit about, you know, some of your early foster care and then as it relates to finding football. I believe it was uh, age 14, you said, when you started playing. Yeah, man. Yeah, you talked about like the freedom and purpose that it gave you. Talk about that. 
Yeah, I mean, we're all searching for something that makes us feel like this is what we're supposed to do. You know, like that, that thing that anchors us to it. And for me, it took a lot of years to get there. So I was put in foster care at three years old by my mom, uh, me and my three siblings were. And so I pretty much started where a lot of people end up at some point, which is like lost, uh, you know, emotionally feeling like you don't matter, like nobody cares, or like, you know, just you have no idea what to do. And you're totally just in, in a free flow, like a leaf in the wind. Uh, I went through a lot of different craziness from, you know, starvation and beatings and craziness as a kid. And then I finally, uh, at six years old, got put into the home, which is my family now. They, like I had mentioned earlier, like I'm adopted by an all white family. Uh, but that was a year, like a unique dynamic to deal with, you know, showing up places in, you know, 1986 and not like not fitting in, we'll call it. Um, and, and being kind of like that weird oddball kid, it was actually 89, I want to say. And it was, it wasn't a, like a non-diverse area at the same time. So you had a lot of stuff growing up. And then at 14, after just years of missing my real mom, because although you're in foster care and you know, it's not like, you know, your mom's not a great person. You just want to go back with your real mom because normalcy is what we seek. Even though normalcy might not be the good thing for us, we seek this level of normalcy because it's the evil that we know. And so that's the evil I knew I wanted that until I finally wised up 11 years later uh, and I severed my mom's rights. I said, I no longer want you to be my mom while you know, standing in court at 14 years old. And then I got to don my first helmet, man. I got to, uh, I got to release a lot of that, that tension that builds up with like, damn it, like I, just, I wanna go run and go play and, and have some control of my life because a lot of us feel like we have no control of what's going on. And for me, it was that first moment I could put a helmet on and go hit Billy as hard as I could hit Billy, and Billy couldn't get mad at me. <laughs> like it was, it was cheered on. That was uh, eighth grade or freshman year. You that was eighth grade. grade. Wow! So you got eighth one grade. season in before your high school career started. That now one season. I, I've heard you. I've I've heard you quote this that you weren't very good. Now I have a hard oh, time. Yeah. I have a hard time imagining that someone who wound up playing. <laughs> It, all the way making it to the NFL that you were uh, you weren't very good but what was that like doing something outside your comfort zone but yeah. also fun and free and, and kind of probably put you in a flow state what was that like to uh, having that release and then uh, realizing that it was something you could be good at yeah it, it sucked awesomely you know it's like it's like one of those things we all have something that we really want to do and we we're, we have this passion to do it, but we usually suck in the beginning, you know, like we're trying to figure it all out. Your podcast, you yeah, wanted to do this. Podcasting. Right? I'm not saying you suck now. I'm saying, but when the, and you probably started, it was like, man, I don't know what to do. It's just going to be tough to navigate. Brutal. Maybe your first interview is kind of like, ah, what do I say? Yeah. But then now you're smooth flowing, right? And, and I think what happens throughout our life, what happened to me was you start this thing, you love this thing, and then what happens is it gets hard and you have a decision to make. You can choose to make a really great excuse as to why you're not going to do this anymore. Something that is so believable, even allows you to sleep well at night. Or you say, you know what? I want to do this thing and I'm going to figure a way to go through the angst of it being difficult, me not being very good, and me growing into this. This is the whole Carol Dweck mindset thing. Growth mindset or fixed mindset. So for why me, do, I just, why do people have such a hard time being honest with themselves about stuff like that? Because you hold a mirror up to inadequacies. Now you're saying like, hey, you might not be perfect. And you know what's funny is we'll all say like, oh, I'm not perfect. But the moment that you're, you're you know, put in front of a true imperfection, we don't like, that. look at social media. We want to show everybody how awesome we are. And the moment you put something up that's negative or rude, like now you're being vulnerable and people are like, I don't want that. Look at my life. It's so amazing. So when you have to actually hold a mirror up and say, oh, I might suck at that, that sucks to hear. And no matter who you, for me, it sucks to hear these things, you know? And, and so the thing is, is we usually do it because we're fearful of other people's perceptions of us or judgments of us. And the moment that you let go of that, it's the moment you give yourself permission to be a mess up. You give yourself permission just to suck for a little bit, which it truly is the athletic experience. You have a coach, you're not very good. His job or her job is to yell at you and tell you how bad you are and tell you get better. So is that so, what it was for you? Was it sports that, and it was for me, it is for a lot of people that are athletes yeah. and that's why it's a good gig to get into it the earlier, the better, but is it sports that humbled you? Is it sports that kind of brought that out that made you be honest with yourself and your shortcomings and where you could improve? Uh, yeah, it had to, cause I loved the feeling of it too much. I think that was the big part of it is, is I had something I loved so much. I was willing to go through the, the, you know, the craziness and the hardship of it all. But if you have something you don't love enough, you're, you're never going to stick in. I think, Steve Jobs says that, make sure you love it. Cause if not, it's gonna suck every day. But when you love it, you have passion for it. You'll find a way to get through all the craziness that you know, most people won't endure to find success in that thing. Is it an obsession? Uh, I, don't, I don't know, here's the thing is, I don't know what I'm obsessed about, you know? I think, I, I would tell you my, my logical brain would say no. My wife would tell me, hell yes. <laughs> like, cause, <laughs> cause for my logical brain, like I'm doing it right now. Like I'm like, my identity doesn't want to latch onto this thing if you're obsessed with something. Oddly enough, I got a sticker over here that says obsessed, right? Um, 
but I, I look at an obsession, an obsession as a, a, a we have no balance, right? I'm obsessed with this thing. Nothing else matters. I'm just doing this all day, every day. And I think when we get obsessed about certain things, sometimes something's left in the wayside and we damage it. So I'm, I'm big at attention to detail. And I, I think one thing that's worked for me is, you know, I, I found a, an obsession with coaching. And, you know, when you're working 95 hours a week for less than minimum wage, sometimes mm. that obsession gets to be unhealthy. But yeah, if really, if you really focus on the on the detail, right, and I had to stop and think to myself, you know, what is it about coaching that I like, you can boil it down any number of things, but let's just use one of them competition, for example, yeah. mm -hmm. you can find competition in almost anything that you do, if it's leading yeah. young individuals, if it's trying to coach, I mean, those things can be done from all different business aspects. So mm -hmm. I think trying to be honest with yourself and really boil down those details can be important as well. Yeah, I agree. So you were 14, you weren't very good. You're probably clumsy all over the field, but you're strong and you were aggressive. So at what point did you decide you wanted to be great? Uh, it was not in football, actually. It was in an English class, uh, Mr. Howell's English class. So I, oddly enough, I wasn't very strong. I was kind of fast. I was like a little, the little crazy kid who just wouldn't slow down out there, but I wasn't an amazing <laughs> athlete. It, what it was, was I was sitting in uh, English class and, and I had pretty much already checked out. I had my adoptive mom was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. My older brother was like the rock of the family for me and he pretty much took off to the military. And so I'm sitting here with no guidance, no structure. My dad's taking care of my mom, my, you know, and I was like, you know what, this is just, it's too hard. I actually did check out of football. I was like, I'm done. Like, I'm not good at this. I, I don't like it. I had a decent game and that was it my entire freshman year. And so I just checked out and then I'm sitting in this classroom in the back right corners, two girls sitting next to me in a, a love seat and they're having this conversation back and forth. Now they don't know I'm listening because I have this black parka I'd bring to school and put over my head with a bag of cinnamon toast crunch. I'd eat that all day while they just, it just, I was sleeping in borderline. And one girl says to another girl, a simple statement that was incredibly powerful for me. She says, well, the reason I'm so bad is because I'm in foster care. And it was one of those things where, like, you never truly hear your excuse out loud. Mm -hmm. And then when you do hear it out loud and it sounds ugly, you got to be faced with that. And so for a lot of us, we'll make these excuses, but they live in our brain and we rarely say them out loud to somebody. But when somebody else says it and you, you hear how just bad it sounds, it's like, uh, it may be just like disgusted that that was the excuse. Because for me, I'd said, you know what? I'm this foster kid. I'm not supposed to do great. Even my own mom didn't love me. Like, why am I trying to be good? And we make these things actually beat ourselves up to make us not feel bad about not pursuing greatness. And so it just made me go home and say, holy crap, like, I don't want to be that. I want to be great. I didn't know what I wanted to be great at, but I knew that football was something I loved. And I, I had this thought that, okay, well, I know what I'm doing right now is not making me great. So what can I do that could give me a chance? Not guarantee success, but give me a chance. And what it was was just working my butt off. So I lifted weights, caught a football every single day, started up the next year as a friggin' animal. <laughs> so that perspective that that girl gave you in class, just by making a comment that you were, you happened to be open to at the time, you heard it. That's something that not a lot of people even experience, that perspective shift. Yeah. So when, that, when that happened and you decided to come back the following season, did you have a different perspective? Did you have a different yeah. outlook? What was, your, what was your attitude toward football that it was different than the previous year? Yeah, you know, I think what it boils down to, so this is actually, I'm doing a ton of research right now on identity, trying to figure out like, you know, what makes us us, right? And there's a lot of different areas that, that section into it. But I think what it was for me is like my off season, I put all this work into being better. And a lot of us, we, we kind of, we want a, a big result. But we, we do have to work. We hear it all the time. And you, you can't really get to the point of saying, oh, I work really hard. I'm going to do this thing and be great at it. Like, you have to know it through your soul that you worked harder than somebody else. And so what happened for me was I put an hour upon hour of work every single day to where I shifted my internal identity to where when I showed up on that field, I was angrier. I was a little bit more driven. And big thing was I wouldn't allow you the right to beat me because you hadn't earned it big part of me was like, if I'm going to step in front of you, I know what I did at home in the dark when no one was watching. I know what I did. So when we're out here right now in the light, you don't have the opportunity or the, the right to beat me at this. And that was a different perspective I applied. And it shifted my identity to being the guy from like, I kind of suck. And maybe do I deserve to be out here to no, this is my field. I own this. I'm going to show up. And it was that shift in me that, that drove me to do like everything else in life, you know, college scholarship, NFL, gym, all this craziness I've been doing lately. Um, that all came from those moments in time and as you know, a 15 year old kid. I love that. I'm big on self uh, analysis. And I think that analyzing your own identity at any point in your life is always healthy. It's hard to do. And sometimes yeah. it's kind of a, a slap in the face, but it's usually always healthy. Mm -hmm. I, think for, I think for you, Anthony, you faced that earlier than a lot of folks did. And probably just because of the life circumstances that you were put into. 
Uh, what other areas do you think people could have that same experience? Obviously, for a young athlete, it could be from their coach. But why are so many people not in tune with that until they get older? You know, because we're not forced to do it at a young age. There's always that thing of if life is early, you know, easy early, it's hard later. If it's hard early, it's easy later, right? Most people, sports are a good veil of protection from the real world sometimes, especially when you play off into college and in the pros. So you're not living in the real world for the most part. I mean, you might have had a hardship as a kid. I'm not taking that from anybody. Some, I mean, I grew up poor too. I wasn't all of a sudden as family. We had money. Like I grew up real poor still. But for me, I always had the veil of like, okay, if I show up and just do my academics, like, you know, I'll take care of school and I have that little bubble there then I got sports like for most majority of the day I'm doing something and then in the college same thing and so I think what happens for a lot of us is we get out of sports and now we're slapped in the face with this this real world of like holy crap who am I without this sport like if I'm not the basketball player like who am I when I go home like I was the NFL guy when I lost my career like I go home it's no longer Anthony you know NFL Anthony it's just oh Anthony the dude that used to play and it's a weird shit of like who am I and so when we're faced with this as athletes that's a hard thing to figure out because there's this ego we've built up. We've had to have for our sport we played and now it's useless. Now, now, now what do we do? We go home. It's a little bit of shame because by the end of my career early and I told everybody I was going to play forever, you know, now I got to eat that. Now some of us, we do plan for it. Like, Hey, I know I'm not going to play in the pros. I'm going to, you know, get done with my career, go home, get a job. But even then now we come home and we have to figure out, okay, well, everybody, you know, I don't have a schedule for myself. How do I keep a schedule when it used to be held for me? That's you know, right. I, I, how do I take care of making sure I'm, I'm doing the right work? Because we're also used to doing, for the most part, the right physical work. Show up, here's my workout sheet, do my workout, do the practice, I head home. Well, now you got to go and be more self-reliant. You got to create your schedule. You got to make sure the work you're doing is right. And then all of a sudden, where, where we get lost, I think, is we do this work. And in the past, we could see it show up in, in you know, ones and zeros on a scoreboard. I, I did my work, I show up, I won a game, I lost a game, finite. Whereas now the real world has no scoreboard. And I got to, like, am I winning? <laughs> am I losing? Like, and that sense of just not completeness or not solidified in that um, solidarity, I want to call it. Yeah. Like, it, it's tough to, to just sit with that. And so we go home and it's like, holy crap, this sucks. How do I get happy again? How do I get that same feeling? For you, you found a podcast. For me, I found speaking and coaching. And it's always different for every person. Yeah, absolutely. That's that same self-analysis, being able to figure that out. So you've, you've had to earn it almost everywhere you went, Anthony. I, I read all about your story. Uh, for anybody listening, it's definitely worth going and checking out all of Anthony's stuff. We'll link to some of his websites and socials at the end of the show. But, um, you know, having to earn it everywhere you go is a lesson not a lot of people learn now. Do you, get, do you get frustrated when you hear people talk about or you witness people being upset or complaining about their shortcomings, downfalls, or things that they've not achieved? when really they have only a small amount of themselves invested or they really aren't trying to earn it. You know, it's tough. Someone asked this question before. They said, do you give people blatantly, transparently honest information or feedback? And to be honest, you'd want me to say, yes, I do. I give it to them tough, right? Because most people take a pride (laughs) in saying that, like, I'll give it to them straight. But to be honest, most people are not ready for that. Uh And so typically I don't, what I do is I plant seeds. So I have people like, for example, some people nearby in my, my actual physical area that I, I communicate with and some people at a distance and a lot of them, like they'll tell me they want something and then when they show up to do it, they, they give half effort. It drives me insane and I can do one of two things. One, I can, I can dig into them and tell them up front like, hey, you're not doing this right. You're sucking at this. This is, you know, it's not going to be a, a something that's going to you know, serve you well. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes athletes or for military guys, like they don't take it well, even though what they did their entire career was take this feedback, right? So what I've found is that as opposed to shutting somebody off, because the moment that I'm blatantly just, you know, in on somebody, they shut off. They, they don't come around me. They don't want to be, you know, they don't want to listen to me talking. Like, they don't want to hear from me. And now I've cut off a tie that, that can help them get better. So what I do is I plant seeds. So I'll, I'll make a statement of what's going on. I'll say, look, you know, I understand where you're at right now here. This is what we got to do. We got to find a way for you to get just one step closer to this goal, one step closer where you want to be. And, and right now what you're doing obviously hasn't gotten you there. It's a reality because you're not there right now. So I think it'd be smart for you to go back and, and just do a self-check and say, hey, am I doing everything I really can do to get there? And if you find yourself in a level of comfort in that moment of like, yeah, I'm doing everything, then you're dead wrong. Because what you want is going to take a different you. There's going to be a discomfort tied to that 100% in some way. And so I, I plant the seed. They can walk away and say, let me, let me do a self-check. Because now, if it's their idea that they're not working hard, they'll give themselves permission to work hard. If it's my idea forced upon someone in any way, shape, or form, no one ever lets that seed take root. Yeah, you've got to start with why. That's a, there's a good book by Simon Sinek about that. If you, yep. you got to start with why. And I think that 
all good coaches probably have that trait. You can tell someone to do something, um, but it's definitely more the connecting of the dots and pointing out the reasons as to why it is you want to do something. We had a coach on here, Jason Aker. He's the he's now the head coach at Oklahoma Baptist basketball team, mm-hmm. and uh, he talked about well, the first things that he established with his players, his new team that he was just coming into for the first time was, I need to figure out what it is that you truly want. Because most people are going to say, especially as athletes, are going to say, well, I want to win. Yeah. Well, okay, let's break this down. What is that going to take? And for each of you in this room, it's going to be different. And for some people in this room, that's going to mean playing a role that you're not going to be all that happy with. So let's really boil it down. What do you actually mm-hmm. want? And that's a proponent of good coaching is being able to connect those dots for people because it's hard to stay motivated or to have a high level of effort and achievement every single day if they're not understanding why, why they're working. Exactly. But yeah. And even if they know what they're working for, sadly, they'll still come up to the level of, of their, like their comfort of work they're putting out. Like, so what I tell people most of the time, I say your work ethic sucks. I don't care what, you can tell them whatever it is, but it sucks. And it's not that it sucks in, in comparison to the world, but it usually sucks in comparison to what you want because what you want, you'd already have if your work ethic was level it's supposed to be. It's a common sense thought if you think about it, right? But Absolutely. what you do is when you challenge, so like for here's a perfect like metaphorical example. People tell me all the time, I own a gym back home right now. And people are like, I'm trying real hard to lose weight. I'm doing everything I can. I'm working my butt off and I just, I can't seem to lose weight. So I'll be like, all right, let's go check your workout out. So I'll go check the workout out and their workout is like my warm up. It's like how, and the, but for them though, just for them, and I'm not taking anything for them, that's their level of hard work, but what they want way up here. So there's a humongous difference in wh- where they're at and what they want. And so I have to explain to them like, look, dude, you may want this thing amazingly, but where you're topping out your level of hard work or your, your you know, ability to output that, that effort, it's not high enough. It sucks. And the moment you can accept that, you can actually do more. What you're receiving is almost always directly on par with the effort that you're giving. Always, almost, not almost. almost every single time. <laughs> every <laughs> time, man. Yeah. Um, what work I'm you've done in the past. Mm-hmm. For the most part, people can control their own destiny, and you just have to earn it. You have to know what you want. You have to go get it. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about coaching. I, I can hear it in your voice, Anthony. You made a great football coach or sports coach. Obviously, you're taking your coaching on a on a more personal level. But what else makes a great coach besides connecting those dots for people? Uh, what other traits do great coaches have? Uh, I think they have a, a level of being able to make other people be accountable to their own dreams, their own visions they wrote out. So I like what you said is, you know, everybody said, tell them what they want. But the problem is some coaches, um, they want to be liked. They don't want to be disliked, but they want, like they, what we're really looking for is love and respect as a coach. I think that's the it's same as parenting. I'm a parent. If you want to call it coaching, it's, it's coaching every day. <laughs> like it's what I'm end up doing. But what I realized is a lot of coaches will have somebody, you know, do their thing and they want someone to like them so much that what ends up happening is, is they don't push the person when they need to be pushed. They don't become the coach they need. They become the coach the person wants. And the coaches somebody wants typically won't get them where they want to be. It's a weird kind of concept. I'm sure you get it. And so for me, one of the big things I do is I make other people create the vision where they want to go. The reason why it's done that way is because you will protect what you create. Mm -hmm. If we create this, if me and you create this together or you create this, now it's your idea. And it's your ability to go forward in that. Like this hurts relationships when people try to make the other person do something as opposed to realizing like, Hey, what do they want? And then if you can help somebody stay close to their vision, use that as the push. Now it's much better. So for me, we create the thing together. So you're engaged, you're bought in. And now my job is to point out when you're not going in alignment to that thing. And you that's pretty much it. Your own, you fight harder for your own dream. Yeah. yeah if, if I tell you, like, here's a, my son, plays football now he didn't play for like three years he's playing at a local high school now de la salle and uh and he you know he went and he wanted to you know get in the team and then he made the team and i was like all right now try to start like, that's the natural order right you get in the team you want to start but it's not in him to desire to start he likes being part of the organization part of the team like that's what he likes and it's tough for me to want more for him than he wants for himself and when i do that i damage the relationship because now i make him feel less than i make him feel bad but his thing is like he wants me in the team and so as dad I may not like that, but at the same token, he's getting what he needs out of the sport. He's understanding how to be consistent, how to be accountable, how to be responsible, how to show up on time, like how to prepare and be ready. Like those are the real things sports teaches. You don't have to start to get those things. That was me trying to impose my thoughts on him. And so as a, you know, this perspective as a coach, like if he has a desire to do something, all I got to do is now is say, Hey, show up on time to practice, do your work at home, like be, you know, do whatever you committed yourself to. I'm going to hold you to that standard but I can't try to push him out of the standard if he doesn't want to be out of it. 
Yeah, it's got to be his dream. Well, yeah. I, Anthony, I want to come back to family here in a minute. But before we do, I want to stick to to coaching on just one yeah. more question. So oh, yeah. when, you, when you talk about where you've learned to be a coach from or the experiences you've had that have helped you to become a better coach, who are some people? Give me some examples that are mentors. You know, like oh, what, yeah. what, what have been your biggest moments and lessons from other people, or other folks that have taught you to be the coach you are today? Uh, I think it goes back to high school. The first guy was named Tim Manley. Tim Manley was this guy that was a, he's pretty much a yard duty guy, you know, he, yeah. he, uh, campus security, I think it was. And it was funny because I, I this moment in time in high school where I was just trying to navigate football and do my thing. And I was getting in trouble. I got arrested for doing dumb stuff in the middle of the night. It's in my book, if you guys want to go read that. <laughs> um, and it just, he was one guy, he sat down, he said, you know what, even the principal doesn't believe in your ability to succeed. But but for me, I'm going to sit you right here, right now. And he actually was driving me in his little golf cart. He's like, I can see you playing in the NFL someday. He's like, I don't know how it's going to work out, but he said, I can see you doing that, man. He's like, you have the, the mindset for it, the drive, the athleticism. He said, I want to see you there. So it was one person just telling me that they believed in stuff. I was, bet I was capable of doing more than I even saw. And so as a coach, sometimes, yeah, you want someone to, to have a big vision for themselves. It's got to be their idea. But if their brain isn't set to think at the scale it can, you can also open up their mindset to let them be aware of what you think they're capable of. Because then, yeah, then then now that can still be their dream. But you're not saying you should play in the NFL. You're saying I can see you there. Yeah. So when he paints the picture, now I can see that same painting. Positive and it opens it up. Yeah. Um, then my college coach, man, he was a he was a hard dude, man. He was hard <laughs> nose. Oh, I, to be honest, I hated him when I was there. I hated knowing he was in town when he was in town in the off season. Bro. Like, what's what's oh, his name? His name's Don Pelham. He was the head coach at Oregon. He was the assistant coach. He was a linebackers coach. Okay. He was my, my guy. And he was, I kid you not, I, I couldn't stand him. But then, I mean, it's just, for example, there was times like I got, I was like doing dumb stuff in the dorms. He made me roll like 200 yards in the football field. I failed three finals that day, puked everywhere. Um, <laughs> if, if we as linebackers had to be like, if the team had to be there at 12, we had to be there at 10. You know, if academics were due on Friday, we had them done by Wednesday. Like, you know, everything. We had to be out before practice getting our hand drills done. If we weren't sweating when practice started, he'd make us sweat afterwards. Like, and he just, you, I couldn't stand how, how much he was on it. And then I graduated, and then I played for John Gruden with the Buccaneers. And Gruden was cake. Mm, wow. You know, I'm not sure it, there's many people that probably can honestly look at that and say, I played for John Gruden, and it was easy. Like it, it was routine for me. <laughs> it was. And I'm not nothing from John because he is a phenomenal human being and coach. But at the time was kind of like this, like I'd done this. I'd yeah. been to this for four years. And then when I've, I've since hung out with my coach, like we actually went uh, this last, uh, last year went and hung out this speaking event because he was kind of in between coaching jobs. He's now at UCLA. But one thing he told me, he said, you know what? When your parents drop you off, you know, they're, they're having this boy get dropped off at 18 years old. My job's not to, to make you a great football player, but make you a great man. And if I make you a great man, you'll become a great football player. Isn't and, that and awesome seeing the, the coach player relationship evolve over time? You know, I, yeah. just, I actually just had, I just posted this on some of my social media accounts. I had a former player of mine reach out and just say, Hey man, you know, thanks for being honest with me. Thanks for pushing me. Yeah. Uh, all the, all the things that we as coaches hope that we're doing, but we don't know until later. Yeah. Uh, and he, he sent me a really nice message about it. And to see that evolve, you know, that it, it's reminiscent of what you just said about hearing your coach. How, how cool is that, that you get to go, you know, socialize with that coach and yeah. he's had that impact on you. And now you can kind of be on the same level of understanding and be in a position yourself to have an impact. I just think that that's the most wonderful thing. It's a blast. Mentors and coaches. Yeah. If you were giving advice to a high school kid right now, what would you tell them about mentors? Oh, man, find somebody that you respect. Uh, because if you don't respect them, you're not going to listen to them. And it's tough. And most people are like, well, I don't know. I respect a lot of people. And I, and I don't. Like, so what I typically say is, because when you're young, you don't really, most people don't know who to trust. They don't like it. And they're, they're thinking they should go follow this guy that played at a high level. Sometimes the guy or girl that played at a high level, they may not be a solid human being. Not every player is meant to be a coach. Like, I don't think people grasp that. Just because I played in the NFL, in no goals. way, yeah, it doesn't qualify me to be a coach. Just I played a sport, right? So what I think high school kids should do is, is just trust your gut. It might be a teacher. It might be a, another student that's a little bit older, like that you've seen do some things you respect. But it's got to be somebody you respect and someone your gut feels actually cares for you. Like your gut. Because I think if you can just like settle it, like who actually, who listens to me when I talk? Who reaches out just to say, hey, hey, how's your day going? Like who just taps in and, and makes me feel warm and comfortable? 
Like you find that person and it's somebody you respect, it's, it's doing something greater. It might not even be in sports. It might be a, like a teacher, the English teacher, who knows? But you find one person, just talk to them, hey, is it possible I can you know, stop in here and have a lunch with you once, you know, once in a while or something? And a mentor doesn't have to be somebody you're like saying, hey, mentor me. It's just someone you develop a relationship and then when you have problems, you can come to them and that person can tell you how they would navigate that situation. Let's, uh, let's shift gears now, Anthony. Um, let's shift, talk about, I like shifting. Yeah, let's talk, let's talk about family here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and I keep referencing this. So those of you listening, you need to go read Anthony's bio and just kind of see what I'm saying when I say that he dealt with adversity. But between your adversity and your football career, the lessons that you learned and the perspectives that you gained during that time are now for you at this point invaluable. Yeah. How are you planning or trying or hoping to have some of those values instilled in your children, knowing that they're probably never going to have to face that? Or even with the football stuff, your son, yeah. if his dream is not football, he's going to have to learn it elsewhere. You know, what yeah. do you do as a parent uh, to try to to try to help assist some of that? Yeah, I mean, as a parent, it's that's honestly a hard question. I think a lot of people are trying to figure that answer out. I don't, I don't believe I've figured it out completely, but I have my way of doing. My wife and I have our way of doing it. The thing is, we don't rob our kids of their hardships. A lot of people want to make life easy for other people, like you know, I'll just, I'll take care of this, I'll pay for this, and then what ends up happening is they are all of a sudden dropped into the real world. And we, when we're younger, we want that. We, we want the easy road because it feels good, right? Mike, my, my son all day, if he didn't have to ever like, you know, work a little bit and do chores, like he'd love that. Let's, let's be honest. But then if I do that, I'm robbing him of the hardship he needs so that when he gets later on, like 18 years old and it's off to college, that he doesn't fall apart. Like that, if you're a person who's listening and mom is hard, dad's hard on you, it's not because they don't love you. It's because they actually love you enough to say, look, I'm trying to prepare you this world is going to eat you alive if you get into it unprepared. That's right. It's like, it's like, it's like dropping your kid into a dark forest with bears with no flashlight and no pack. Like that's going to happen to you. You're going to get eaten alive. I think it's and important so, for us to remember too, as adults, to be honest. I mean, I, I think that we can really easily fall into routine and, and into our yeah. comfort zones as adults. It's, we can all sit here and point to the obvious situations where a child is being coached or mentored or parented by someone who's being tough on them. That's good for yeah. them. But we need to remember that as adults as well, that when we're thrust into a situation that we're uncomfortable with, even though we know the outcomes may or may not be positive for us, the lessons learned are going to be important. And we've got to maintain that growth mindset like you talked about before. Yeah. Um, Anthony, let's, I'm going to say one word. Everyone that comes on the show has to say, or whatever their comments are. You can tell me a story. You can define it, whatever you want it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but go ahead and speak to the word grit. Grit. Ooh, it's a good one. Actually, there's a, um, there's some studies out that show that grit is the determinant between success and lack of success. Oddly. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, I just watched a whole Ted talk on it actually, but yeah, that, that, I think grit is this one thing that, that people are summarizing. It doesn't matter how smart you are, what you come from. It's the emotional grit that allows people to succeed. And it's mostly tied to the aspect of when you run into that wall, like I run into a wall that 99 people also ran into. Do I have the grit to see see myself push farther, push harder. And it's more of a thing like in the belly of, of you that when, like you think mid game, mid game or end of the game and something's going on, it's, you can see visually, literally visually in most games, who has it and who doesn't. It's the person that when the time gets tough, they either like sink their shoulders, look at the ground and you can see their body language is telling me they're tired, they're prepared to give up and they're now making a visual excuse as to why they're about to lose. But the person you see just shake their head, Shoulders come up, chest puffs out, and they just settle in like, I'm about to do this, right? The grit is what's now in that person. And that little bit of being able just to suck it up for that little bit more is what separates people. And so grit's this thing that literally you have to find a way to get uh, or to dig deep and, and develop. And it's not, it's not incongruent with anybody's personality. The problem is most people who haven't done that, they know they probably should settle in, dig, you know, dig their feet in and, and pop up. But if they've never done it before, then well, they might look funny to other people. Yeah. How do, you, how, do you coach do it? It? how do you coach it? The big thing for me is I, I, I say you got to put the mask on. Like for us, football, when my helmet went on, different dude, Troy Palomalu. I play with Troy. <laughs> if you know Troy, yeah. he was an animal on the field. That, literally, that's understatement. The dude was like, like Thanos out there just murdering folks, right? Just savage. He was so crazy. But off the field, the dude was like a saint. So nice. So pleasant. So respectful. So quiet. Like, you, like you wouldn't even know like he played football 
And then he switches it. And I think that's a, a perfect way to explain, like, you don't have to be different as a person. You have to be different in certain situations. And so in those moments, it's completely okay, accepted and appreciated for you to say, hey, this is who I have to be in this moment. It's not a different person. It's a different quality of that same person. And I think when you can get to that point of developing that grit by getting out of your self-conscious, like, what if they see me differently? Um, you know, what, what, I'm not used to doing this. It's not me to do that. The moment you start saying like those kind of things, well, the problem is what you want, you can't ever get. You're going to keep it at arm's reach because you're thinking that I have to be something different to get that. And you do. You do have to be a little bit different to get that. Or you can make an excuse, stay in this place and keep it at arm's reach, but it's your own arm keeping it away from you. Yeah, you got to earn it. It's, got, it's up to you. you personal, personal responsibility. It's a rarity mm -hmm. these days. Mm -hmm. Well, J Anthony, we just got a few more questions because I know you got to get to, uh, to your I'm good. I still got, I got 22 minutes, so we're still good. <laughs> well, we'll, <laughs> we, got a, we got a couple more here. Maybe some of these are ones you go off on a tangent on. So I'll cut you off if we do get close. I got my All right. clock here. Sounds good. I want to know, I want to know about you opening your gym and mm. what sort of parallels you can draw between what you learned as a football player, yeah. personal coach, and how that has helped you be a better business owner. Holy crap, man. Yeah. So the gym for me was a microcosm of the world. So here's the thing. You get done with sports. You come out of sports and say, I played, you know, as long as I played, I was now 10 years behind my peers in the real world, we'll call it, right? I don't have any job skills except for running really fast and hitting other people. Can't do that in the real world, right? So now I got to figure out, well, how do I become successful in this real world that doesn't put my skills on a pedestal anymore? It might get me an opportunity, like a job interview, right? But it doesn't allow me to be successful. These people have been doing these actual skill sets for a decade now. I'm behind the ball. So I got to show up and say, okay, what do I do? Now, when I say a microcosm, what that means, it's like a small world. It's a small little bubble that allows me to, to kind of have like my own world inside of that. So if you think about the real world, there's human interaction, there's hardship, there's, um, you know, navigating common, you know, common relationships between coworkers and my relationship at home. Um, there's dealing with other people in that same world. There's dealing with um, the business aspect to it, the health aspect to it, right? There's all these things going on in this gym business. And for me, when I first opened it, like that was my little microcosm to catch up to the world. So I got in a situation where, you know, a year in, not even a year, I was now looking at bankruptcy. Like if I had at one point, the landlord walked up or like had somebody drive up, give me an envelope, serve me with an eviction paper because I hadn't paid rent in three months. I couldn't, right? So now I got to figure out how to navigate these things. And so it was kind of like for me, fourth quarter, I'm down by one. Like how do I, how do we score this touchdown right now? Now I can easily you know, give up and then the game ends and I go to a new game, right? That would have been my world. Give up on this business, go to a new business or just go get a job. But I buckled down. The grit came out we talked about. And I think right. that was the kind of the, the, the merging of like, here's a sports world that I know real well. And what we can do as athletes, we can oh, tap into this. It's so powerful. Even non-athletes, the intangibles that we have from our past experiences, when we can really pull those out and dig in, we can, as athletes, to be honest, you can t dominate the world dominate the world because if you never give up and you never quit your brain is literally wired to find out how to move quickly and win it's what it, it's what we're wired to do like okay now it's, it's the middle of like the, the end of the fourth quarter the pressure's on and most people crack under the pressure but when you can get to that point of like oh i've been here before let me figure this out you move quicker right and so for me i moved quick and i was able to navigate that so two weeks later i still have the gym two months later i'd increased the revenue from like seven grand a month to like 20 grand a month. I kept the, I actually moved the next year to a bigger facility. Like I went from a point of where I was literally looking at bankruptcy to balling. Like the, the gym was moving, everything was grooving. And it was solely because I navigated the, the pitfalls of the current business. Now along that same journey, I had people still like $12,000 from me, from trainers that had been there kind of starting it out with me. Um, I lost my relationship, my marriage in the middle of doing it. Like I, I was so busy at that gym. I was obsessed with it that it damaged my relationship. I lost my wife, you know, my kids. It was all a complete separation. Um, I dealt with people that were, uh, you know, clients of mine that had shifted gyms, you know, like she so had to deal with betrayal and, and an aspect of like people that were in like, you know, close to you. Uh, my health, I was in the worst shape of my life while I owned a gym. <laughs> it was <laughs> the oddest thing, right? Like you think we sit there and hang out. No, I'm, 
I'm trying to get other people in all day long and I'm That's drinking right. Gatorades and eating candy to keep my sugars high to keep going. Right. Oh, be and careful. So, There's a lot of players and coaches who think Gatorade is still the healthiest thing you can be drinking. Oh, stop it. <laughs> no. Like it's, and the thing is, is, it's just not enough time. Like you're always, your brain's always in sprint mode. That's what it is. You're always in sprint mode. And then what happens is you find out that you've been sprinting in the wrong direction. Uh, That's what happened for me. Of course. Correct. I was always moving. And so when I got to this point of like, holy crap, I got to figure this out. Like most of the things that we're working for, because you ask a lot of guys, what are you working for? Provide for my family. Like, you know, I want families first to take care of them. But then when you're with your family, your brain's still back at practice. You're trying to get out. Like you can't figure out how to shut that, that, that busy itch off to just mm -hmm. be present. And so everything you're working for, you're actually damaging because you're not working correctly. Right. And so for me, like I lost everything just so I could realize how much it meant to me. And I had to stop the sprint. It didn't mean I couldn't go as fast, though, because you think about it, efficiency is what creates the ability to run faster, longer. Our lives are marathons. They're not sprints. They feel like sprints because there's deadlines, but we're looking only at the short distance, not the long term. And when you can look at the long term, you can say, cool, if I can just, you know, keep a little bit of balance here and do this, I'll make the short sprints still phenomenal. I'll, I'll, you might even do better at them because you're more rested. But then you start taking the time to be away from it and just focus on what you're really trying to focus on, family for a little bit. It makes your life like easier. Like you don't have that busy itch inside and everything's organized and balanced. And so that was what I learned in the gym was how to just figure life out. Yeah, a lot of coaches could benefit from that. It was a really unhealthy life balance. I'm not completely ruling out <laughs> the idea of going back and coaching hoops again someday. I, I really enjoyed it. I won a national title my first year. I just kind of re reevaluate everything that we were – that we were doing but both myself and the staff that I were on were some of the hardest working people I've ever been around yeah but my personal life took a tremendous hit I, I was mm. I was losing my mind and I think yeah. that there's a lot of people that don't understand um, balance doesn't mean that you have to slow down balance is all about perspective it's all about yeah. where you're attributing your energy and where you're attributing your thought and being present being in the moment mm -hmm. another, another podcast guest we had an excellent speaker as well Alan Stein uh, he talked about and I know he made sure that he didn't take credit for the quote, but he talked about uh, be where your feet are and how important that is. Just be present. Yeah. That's, that's really good. I like that. My coach said, be where you are when you are. So you yeah. all the time. Yeah, that's really good, man. I love that. You know, being people have such a hard time with it. That's why, especially with the world of, of attention span decreasing that we live in mm -hmm. now, that's why it's so important. You know, so many people are getting into mindfulness and meditation and stuff. And I think a lot of that is yeah. because we're just having a really hard time being present in each moment. So we got to practice that now. It's another yeah. skill we've got to work on because it's not natural. Yeah. And like you said, you got to know why you're doing it. I think a lot of people, like, you know, let's be honest, coaches, especially football, like, I'm not with that stuff. Like, it's just, you know, it's not me. Like, you literally get these alpha dudes. But at the same time, these alpha dudes, they cause problems. And if you're coaching other people, young men, they're watching you not only in how you coach them, but how you live your life. Mm -hmm. And so if you're generally trying to help other people develop and grow, whatever it is, you got to grow you first. You can only grow somebody to the level you've grown yourself. And, and right. if you aren't, if you don't want what your life is for the people you're working with, you got to change parts of your life. It's like, it's your duty to do that. So for me, like I, I don't do this, what I do in coaching people without working on myself steadily. I, I got books up the yin yang. Like I'm about to start this book called the I Ching, right? That about change and shift. Like I am not going to get in the microphone and talk to you without working on me heavily, right? So as coaches, if you're going to have a, a platform or a microphone or something where people are listening, and damn it, your duty is to better yourself. It's the only way you can better those other people. Yeah, absolutely. I love that, man. That's that's phenomenal. I'm going to have to come out to California and get a workout in the gym. The, the, come get it, bro. We got best. something called game time training I made up here. No, I, 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 really, I really enjoy this conversation about talking about your business because I think it's just a whole other line of coaching. You know, even for example, you talking about what you struggled with as a gym owner and you being so honest and upfront about that. I think that makes me feel like the training that you had as a football player and being comfortable at the end of your rope is what has allowed you to be a better business owner as well. Oh, yeah. Just hearing those stories uh, just scream success. I mean, those are the things that people down the line, once they've built something that for years has had a lasting impact on people, there's always stories like that. And there's always mm -hmm. that response to that, that dealing with adversity. Yeah. Um, you know, Anthony, talk to the people about what some of your latest is and I know you said it's going to be shifting some but yeah you know, right now it's trust your hustle 
what yeah. is what's what's the vision right now? What are, where are you, where are you going with this? Where are you taking yeah. all of these lessons you've learned and things you've worked on and putting them in? Yeah. Well, if you think about it, so Trust Your Hustle has been my brand for f- almost four years now. And it's not to say that it's gone. It's not disappearing completely. It's more so getting tucked under something that I think has a greater relevance to the life that we live, right? So Trust Your Hustle conceptually is saying, look, if, if you want to get something, you have to work for it. If you don't trust in your ability, you won't give full to it, which means you're not going to get anything as a positive result in the back end. So you got to trust your abilities, trust your hustle so you can work, right? That is the aspect. But then I was challenged by these guys who some of them own like $300 million businesses. And it's not to say that business and money is successful, but the traits these men have to have to get that is incredible. So I look at more of their human aspects than I look at what they've accomplished, right? And so for me, their challenge was this, which is where I'm actually shifting, right? So that's why when you said, let's shift gears, <laughs> uh, my podcast, I'm going to launch the book I'm going to write. It's going to be called Aw Shift. Oh, right? so, Shift. And it's, it's, the concept is life changes and it's either going to be one of two things like, oh, shift. Yeah, let's do this. Right. A great opportunity or oh, shift. What do I do now? Right. There's two sides of that coin. And so as I develop, like I'm literally all day yesterday for eight hours sat here, like, what do I call the actual company? Because you can't have like Anthony Trucks of all shift. Like that doesn't sound right coming up on stage, you know? <laughs> so the thing for me is developing that. But here's where this all goes and where I take these lessons in. And I never saw it. That's the crazy part. I never noticed it. And it drives me insane because you work so hard for something to find out that it was the wrong thing. Yeah. You, your client, my, my pastor says, it's like, it's like climbing a ladder that's leaned against a building. When you get to the top, realizing it was pretty much leaned against the wrong building. Right. Yeah. So it's like, oh, but what I look at now is like, I, I oddly enjoy shifting and changing. And when you learn to enjoy it, you can actually do it better. And that's where life opens up for you. Because a lot of us, I think life is a great plan for us, but we mess it up. Like, oh, this is a new opportunity, but that's going to be too hard. I don't want to do that. Then years later, we complain because our life sucks. But the opportunity was there a couple of years ago. The problem was we didn't know how to approach the shift or the change positively or correctly. Therefore, we were scared of that evil. The evil we know is always better than the evil we don't know. And, and for me, I've, I've found this weird, and I wouldn't saw it like ease within change, but I've had the change. Whether it was as a kid literally coming home and five different times being shifted from one home to the next. You know, going from, you know, being the, the, the black kid in the black family to the like black kid in the white family, going to new schools, not being good at football, new environment, um, going, you know, having a shift. Every, every time I went to a new stage in life, shift my identity. I was a teen dad in college, found my real dad in college. And from there to the pros, then out of the pros, who the hell am I? Into business. I'm a, I'm a coach. I'm a gym owner. Then I'm a consultant. Then I'm a, a, a coach like this. I speak. And then like all these shifts and change. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm not a husband. And, and so what I realized is over life. At this point now, like I navigate those changes really well because I was forced to at a young age. And so as I shift in this next part of my life, it's me going back and saying, look, look, here's my heart. Here's how it ticks. I'm going to take this. I'm going to put it in your brain and teach you how I did it so I can teach you how to shift. Because when you have life, there's no matter what, two things are happening. We always say change is the only thing that, that is constant, right? It's a weird concept we don't like to address, but as human beings, we like normalcy. We love homeostasis. We are wired to be efficient. That's why our body loses weight when we run. Efficiency. That's why we find ways to make everything easy for us. We like efficiency. It's normal for that. But the problem is that kills us and it kills our dreams. And so as I look at what I'm going to be doing with people, it's saying, hey, look, two things are going to happen. One, it's going to happen abruptly when you don't plan for it. When I lost my career in football to an injury, I didn't expect that. I remember crying when I lost my, like I was sitting there realizing like the game is over for me. Like my heart broke. That's all I knew. And it was scary. And it was like this emotional connection. Like I was losing me. Like it wasn't losing a job. I was losing Anthony, right? And so in doing that, I realized that it happens either abruptly without you wanting it to change. And now you can spin out of control and fall apart and and not feel like working out of it. Because the problem is when you're in that hole, the last thing that you feel like doing is doing any kind of work to get out of the hole. So you stay there longer and you hate it longer. And then you start beating yourself up and now your life tail spins. Or you say, hey, this thing, and that's one side of it, it's the coin. Abruptly, it sucks. The other side of the coin is, look, I'm not okay with this anymore. Like I'm doing something I don't like to do. I feel like, and we get what's called investment bias. We've put so much time into this relationship, into this career, into this just whatever it is, this hobby, that we can't change. Because if we change this, well, who am I now? If I change this job, like who am I? If I leave this relationship, who am I, right? And if we can a- approach that shift in a positive way and understand how to do it proactively, well, now we can actually create the life we're looking for. Because anytime someone changes their life, 
you're changing your identity. You're changing who you are to yourself and to the world. And so my work now is, is, is rooted in teaching people how to make that change gracefully, either by force or by choice. How do you make that happen the right way to where you can enjoy not only the shift and the change of it because you know why you're doing the work, but then you show up in that moment and it's the right moment because you chose it and it's one you can, you can handle gracefully and not feel like you're in this crazy sprint inside. So that's where I'm at, man. I'm trying to come up with a company name for it. To be honest, it's weird. Like I usually have the easy, like I can easily come up with names. I make so many stupid names, but I think the fact that it's so difficult to come up with a cool, unique name tells me I'm in the right place. That's right. That's good, man. That's really good. I'm excited to see it. I'm, I'm excited to see this whole thing unfold. I know you've done some several different brands and programs before, and I'm yeah. confident this is going to be the best yet. Always growing, always improving. That's the goal. Let's go, let's go rapid fire here while we got a couple minutes. Uh, boom, boom. Books. Give me one or two books that are, are can't live without that you'd suggest yeah. to folks, and then give me one or two that you're reading now or about to read. All right, so one is uh, Trust Your Hustle, Life Forth by Fire, written by Anthony Trucks. That's a good one. <laughs> Hey, if you had a book and you don't read. plug your book, you don't love your book. That's I love right. my book, man. It's my life uh, on paper. Everything I can think of that I can just pour out. I held nothing back. Um, another book I love is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, there's a book by my buddy, Brendan Burchard, that he came with right now, too. It's called High Performance Habits. Both are phenomenal books. I like it because um, they both talk to you about life in a non-spiritual way. I think the books that are about shift and change, most people, like, they don't want to latch on because it's about spirituality and who are you and your God kind of, right? But they're good books to understand, like, how you tick in the world. So love those two books. Um, I'm about to read The I Ching, which is about change. It's a, it's a good, thick book I got years ago, but I've never opened up. But I, now that I'm going into this world, I want to know all about that. And then one called The uh, Ego Identity, which is by a guy named James Marsha. Uh, and it's actually suddenly the college psychology students, I think that's the book that they actually go through and read. Um, but I, I'm going to dig into that more so, so I can understand our identity and how it shifts. I think there's nobody right now who's really going into the work of explaining or teaching or guiding people in a simplistic way, how to navigate life and your identity changes. Cause any change you have in life is going to be tied to who you believe you are. Mm -hmm. Can I do this? Should I do this? Who I used to be, which that's the hardest thing I think is we don't realize about the reason we don't make change or don't do most stuff is because it's out of line with our current identity and who we believe that we are. And so I want to know how the brain works that aspect so I can actually develop structure of how to modify that. Because I think one thing that people see that I've noticed in all my research as of late is there's no, everybody points out the problem. Here's the problem. Here's how this works. Here's how this ticks. But nobody says, here's how you get from A to B. That's, what, that's what's missing, I think, is no one's telling you exactly in a simplistic way, how do we gracefully do that? Yeah, that's complicated. The fluidity of our lives is always hard to navigate. But. Yeah. Well, I'm excited, man. That's, that's really great. I love the research and the work that you're doing. All right. This is, this is our last question. Boom. Um, this will be quick as well. 10 seconds or less. You get to provide a waking thought to everyone in the world. So here's, yeah. your, here's your visual. Mm -mm -mm. Alarm goes off in the morning. Every person wakes up the first 10 seconds of their day. They get a message from Anthony trucks. Yeah. What are you going to tell them? The last person you ever want to meet on your deathbed is the person you could have been. Oh, I love that. That's very thought provoking. Anthony, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to come on the show. You've got to get to your mastermind and I yeah. got to get to editing this episode so that it can have an impact. There you go. It all works. This is, this is a good one, brother. We'll have to catch up soon. Count me in. Man, I appreciate it so much. All right, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Team, don't go anywhere just yet. Give me one second. This will be brief. Number one, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode. It means the world to me that you're taking the time out of your day and you see value in our show. So I'm gonna continue to improve and continue to bring you good guests that are inspiring and that are willing to share their stories with you so that you can learn from them. Second thing, if at any point you have a suggestion, please feel free to reach out. My email is jacob, J-A-K-O-B, at myc.team. Lastly, and probably most importantly, we have to game the algorithm. I know that it doesn't seem like a big deal, but the truth is there's a lot of junk out there on the internet. And if we want people to be able to see good information like this, that's actually making people's lives better. I need each and every one of you to like, subscribe, share, post on people's walls, and especially word of mouth. Spread the message. All of our socials are at the MYC study and the website is the MYC study.com. You know, tell your friends, tell your coaches, tell your teammates to go ahead and check out the MYC study. I think that there's a lot of great information and wisdom 
these guests have been bringing people and it's only going to get better because I'm going to continue to grow as a host as well. So all of you that are part of this NYC community, go forth and master your craft. I'll see you guys next week.